Today is lecture six. All right, guys, uh, we're back to lecture. So we do from my textbook is 12.4. Last time we finished 12.3, 12.4. From your new edition, it is chapter 13. Is this again section four? Yeah, maybe section four. It is called price earnings ratios. Price earnings ratios. So uh, price earnings. Ratios known as P E ratios. All right, so these are extremely important. Uh, first and foremost, value investors use them a lot. Second, they are probably the most common and most often used technique by Wall Street for valuation. And the third, most important reason is that. This is not only the most used, but also the most abused technique by Wall Street. The idea is that they often try to mislead people into what's a good, what's a bad valuation, and what not, which I'll be discussing a little bit more. Well, the price to earnings ratio is simply, by definition, nothing more and nothing less than the current price of the stock divided by the earnings. Now, earnings could be trailing. I don't think the textbook covers this stuff, but it's important to understand because we'll show how Wall Street abuses this concept. Trailing means for the past three months, or for the past six months, or for the past 12 months. In other words, uh, trading earnings are earnings which have already been observed and, and are already reported. And the alternative to trading, uh, trading is called, let's put it here, forward. This is what the earnings expectations are. This is what the earnings expectations are. But here's the key. Expectations by who? Wall by Wall Street. So this is what Wall Street uses very common to abuse investment analysis by saying, well, they were having a, a, a trading earnings, let's say, of three dollars. Now talk about annual earnings. And they say, but forward-looking, we expect next year's to be? No, five. Only five. Only five. So they are saying if the price today is 30, if the price today is 30, you're paying price 30 divided by 3 income. The PE, the PE ratio is 10. But again, this is not the PE. You call it the trading P is 10. Well, the forward is six. And Wall Street says, see, an earnings fee ratio six is cheap. The stock is cheap. The stock is undervalued. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Wall Street, when it wants to sell stocks, and that's their business game, will always tell you, no matter what, that the forward or the expected earnings are going to be always a lot higher and Wall Street will always tell you that they're going to be a whole lot higher than they already were and in this way they make sometimes uh, appear an overvalued stock to be even undervalued. Well, that's their job. Their job is to get an overvalued stock, make it appear undervalued in order to sell it to investors. Because what Wall Street is, is in the business of selling stocks, all right? But trading and forward. All right, so now let's discuss this thing, earnings, uh, earnings yield. All right, well, well, what is the earnings yield? Well, earnings yield is simply whatever the earnings are divided by the price. So, in the first case, the earnings yield is 
how much in the first case? Point, point one. The first case is the price is 30, the earnings are 3, so 3 divided by 30 point one. is point 0.1. In earnings yield is usually by convention and agreement, you use the annual earnings and express them in percentages. So the stock is yielding 10%. 10% is computed as 3 divided by 30, and 3 divided by 30 is 0.1, which percentages is 10%. So the stock is yielding 10%, not really bad. Now, what if you use the forward earnings? The forward earnings say, oh, you're paying 30 to get earnings of 5. So 5 divided by 30, how much is it? So 16 is about 16, 17. Let's just call it roughly 17%. So what you're telling you is that, oh, your stock is actually not earning 10%, it's actually earning 17%. Alright? The earnings yield. It's actually yielding 17%, which is supposedly very good. In the answer, price earnings ratio of 6 is really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, what they will usually tell you is that the price earnings ratio of 12 to 15 is normal, meaning okay, meaning good. All right. They'll tell you that uh, 6 to 12 is really good. <laughs> That's something about it. Really good. This is PE. P oh, oh, let's put it here. PE is really good. And if you're paying, let's say, 16 to 25, it is, you know, not, not very good. Not very good. Well, it's okay, but not very good. Well, let's try to see what these ranges are yielding. So, if you're getting normal of 12 to 15, what is the stock yielding? How much is the stock yielding? What's the earnings yield? One over 12. Well, one over 12. Well, what's the percentage, guys? What's, how, what, what, what's one over 12? It's about 8%. And 15 is about what? You'd be 
wanting to get at least 12, 10, 12, 15. And if you're going to be getting 10, 12, 15, you, well, mean it's going to be the required return. This means that the yield, sorry, the price earning ratio should be no more than 10. No more than 10. All right? 10. 10, yes. Price earnings ratio of 10 is equal to earnings yield of 10. So earnings yield above 10 will mean price earnings ratio below 10. So usually what Wall Street will say, well, yeah, you might be getting a yield of 5, but you're buying the growth opportunity. The stock will grow on you. And the answer is, well, that's what the risk is for. It may grow, it might not grow. It may earn, it might not earn. It is not clear. And here's the key to understand, because it's difficult to understand. The textbook clarifies it, but not very well. The higher the expected growth, that I was expected to grow 10, 12, 15, the higher the risk. There is little risk in a business trying to grow for the next 10 years with 3%. There's little risk in doing that. But if they factor in the growth of 15% to be sustained over the next 10 years, the risk is extraordinarily high. It may grow, it may not. But the risk is very high that it will not be able to grow, either because the macro economy, something's going to go wrong, or the global economy is going to go wrong, or the government might make an impose a regulation, or a new competition might enter, or the current incumbent competition might use the power of the government to inflict damage on the rapidly growing competitor, or they made a technological change. So there could be thousand and one reasons why a growth of 15% might not be sustained over the next 10 years. But Wall Street sells it as a potential. You know, they call it the blue sky potential, right? It means they sell you this. Yeah, you know, it can go sky high. All right, let's move on and see. All right, so, we, okay, price earnings potential, it's called, okay, uh, earnings multiplier, earnings multiplier. Earnings multiplier is essentially the price earnings ratio. Earnings multipliers, how much you multiply earnings in order to get the current price. Again, earnings could be trading, could be forward. Alright. Now, one of the fundamental facts to understand is that forecasting the earnings multiplier or forecasting the P ratio is extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. So, usually what Wall Street tries to tell you is that first it's very easy to forecast the earnings. The second step they try to convince you is that it's very easy to assume the price earnings ratio. And because these two are easy, the price is a simple multiple of the two. Oh, we expect the uh, earnings of, uh, let's say, five. We expect a multiple of uh, 10, and therefore, the fair price is 50. Right now, the stock sells for 30, so Wall Street says, it's on the value. Which means, you got to buy, and you got to buy now, while it's still under value, all right? Well, it may be, it might not be, all right? So, let's see what's next. <coughs> Okay, the ratio of this to this and whatnot. All right. So now, one of the key characteristics, which is that the PE ratio is naturally related to one over the required rate of return. Well, this is a natural result of the earnings yield. The required rate of return is the required rate of return, is the expected earnings yield, right? Is that the answer? One, so, one over R, right? Yes, one over R. 
So you would expect the price to earnings ratio to be 1 over R. Well, if your required rate of return is 5%, you would expect the price to earnings to be 20. 20. If the uh, required rate of return is 10, you would expect the price to earnings ratio to be 10. 10. And if you, the required rate of return is 20, you expect the price earnings to be 5. So, this is one of the fundamental relationships that you would normally expect. Similarly to this, if you expect the company to grow, and in the same logic that we used last time for the dividend growth model, you may have the P-E ratio. So, P-E ratio will also uh, equal or will be related to 1 over, over R minus G. R minus G. Is the textbook saying it anywhere? I think it does somewhere. 1 uh, of R minus G. <coughs> so, if you have G, what does it mean for price earnings ratio? Is it going up or is it going down? If you have G, what does it imply for price earnings ratio? Yeah. Oh, what is it? All right, so R, let, let, let's try to do the example. R is equal to 10%. So your required return is 10%, and G is, let's say, 5%. If you have no growth for R, what's the PE ratio? 10. 10. So PE equals, please <coughs> come on this side, right? Yeah. PE equals 10, but I'm not good at this side. And over here, PE equals 20. 20. equals 20. So if you have a growth opportunity, growth usually justifies higher price earnings ratio. So, one of the better tricks which Wall Street loves to abuse is when the price earnings ratio is relatively high, you just throw in a little bit higher growth. Let's try to see how this works. Suppose that uh, you're expecting 10% return and the price earnings ratio is 14. The price earnings ratio is 14. Is the stock overvalued? Is the stock overvalued? Price earnings rate of the required return is 10 and price earnings ratio is 14. Well, from this formula, you expect it to be 10. If it's 14, it's overvalued. But Wall Street says what? Wait! It's undervalued. We expect it to grow that 5% or 4% and therefore 14 price earnings is cheap. It is worth 20. Our earnings multiple or multiplier is 20. And 14, it's cheap. You got to buy it. So the point to understand is no matter how high the price earnings ratio is, if you take sufficiently large growth rate, you can make the earnings multiplier justified. Can you justify a price earnings ratio of 100? No. What do you know? <laughs> if you can't justify 100, you don't deserve to be on Wall Street. The answer is yes. If you're on Wall Street, it's very easy. Just say G equals 9. We expect the stock to grow at 9%. If it grows at 9% and the required return is 10, it simply means that 9 minus 10 is 1%, and 1 divided by 1% is 100. So if G, let's write it out, equals to 9%, the price earnings is 100. Well, it may actually sound absurd because saying no, but this is exactly how Wall Street operates. No matter what it is, they'll come up with a number and say, oh, it's cheap. It's always cheap. Stocks are always 
under value. And that's one of the basic approaches. Now, Peter Schiff uses this approach, but he doesn't know number one when he hears, oh, it's going to grow by 7 or 9 percent. There is no way you know, it can grow number one. And number two, he wants to be compensated for his risk. So he will require 5, 6, 7, 8 percent of risk premium on top of inflation and on top of the risk-free rate. So, if it's going to be paying 12 or 15 price earnings ratio, it's going to be yielding 7 or 8 percent. Why bother? Right? No big deal. Let's see what's next. All right. So, let's try to do this now. Uh, suppose we have expected growth of 5 percent. It may happen, it might not happen. And earnings are, as we said, Three. Earnings are, as we said, three. So if you have earnings of three dollars and no growth, then the expected price should be for a yield of 10. What should be the price? Should be 30. Alright? That should be the fair price if there is no growth. Alright? Now, suppose we expect a 5% growth. So, dollar three is the return. <laughs> then you expect 5% growth. What would be the fair value today? 36. Hmm? 36. What do you mean 36? What should be the fair price, guys? All right, I'll make sure that you've got a, you know, question with numbers on, on the exam. I'll make sure. What's the price? Uh, three. What's the price? Sixty. 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 All right. So you would have without growth thirty, with growth sixty. And the difference from thirty to sixty we call P V G. O, which stands for present value of growth opportunities. Present value of growth opportunities. So, in this particular case, the present value of growth opportunities is the difference between 60, which is the value of the stock with growth, and the value of the stock without growth. The difference we call the value of growth, the present value of growth. The textbook derives it a little bit different, but the fundamental idea is identical. Alright? So, question. How can you get 60? Huh? 60. How I got 60? So, I, the question is how I got 60. The answer is very simple. Uh, required rate of return is 10% as before. We assume now 5% growth. So instead of price earnings ratio of 10, which means $3 multiplied by 10, we get 30. Now with growth price earnings ratio is 20. And $3 multiplied by price earnings, or we call it earnings multiplier of 20. 3 times 20 is 60. All right. So the present value of growth opportunity equals simply the current earnings plus the increase in the multiplier which results from the opportunities of growth. All right. Is that fair to you so far? But right, let's see what's next. Uh, return on equity P ratios. All right. Let's see what is a growth opportunity. So let's discuss the concept of uh, growth, growth opportunities. The idea is very simple for a growth opportunity. Uh, first of all, let's discuss the concept of Dividend yield. What is a dividend yield? 
What is it? You can't? No. You don't, you don't have to raise it. You don't have to raise it. Okay. So, dividend yield is simply dividend divided by the price. Alright? The dividend yield may be zero. So, a dividend yield of zero simply means that. Uh, yeah, well, why don't you pause for a second? So, uh, when you get the dividend yield, uh, sorry, dividend yield is when you dividend by the price. So, now, dividends, dividend can be done one of two things. The first thing that you can do with the dividend is you can, uh, uh, oh, sorry, 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 let's, 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 let's fix this thing, let's fix this thing. So, we have, Earnings of my mistake. So once you get earnings, you can do one of two things. One is dividend, dividend, and we call it dividend pay payout. In other words, when you make five dollars of earnings, you can do exactly two things. You either distribute it as a dividend to the shareholders. Reinvest. So you reinvest in the business. Alright? So when you reinvest in the business, it begins to earn whatever the business is right. earning. So from the dividend payout, you have the so called payout ratio. Payout ratio is how much of earnings you are paying out to investors. From reinvestment, you have plow back, plow back, plow back ratio. All right. So, depending on whether you pay out a lot or whether you pay out a little, growth depends on dividend payout. So let's try to write this. Uh, so if, if dividend payout is 100%, so the company earns $5 and pays exactly 5 What is the growth rate? Oh, growth is zero. That's very important to understand. It's very simple, but very important. Growth is zero percent. So, when if they uh, growth is zero, if they pay out the whole thing. Yes. They, so, so the, the 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 company is worth one million and it earned hundred thousand. If you pay out to everybody, meaning to owners, equity owners, the whole hundred thousand. You're reinvesting zero, and if you're reinvesting zero, the company did not grow. Did not grow at all. Alright, so dividend payout 100, growth is zero. Now, the alternative will be for a dividend payout of uh, zero percent, and then the company grows with earnings. The company grows with earnings. So, if earnings grow of 20%, then the growth will be also 20%. So, if earnings grow at 20% and you reinvest all, the company will grow at 20%. Alright? If you reinvest zero, the company will grow at zero. If you reinvest half, the company will grow with half, only 10%. Only 10%. So, the dividend payout ratio is an indicator of whether the company can grow or not grow. Whether the company can grow. But you got to understand, growth by itself is no good. What you need is not growth of the company. What you need is growth of owners' equity. Uh, 
of the value of the firm. And the value of the firm, you got to understand, grows only when the firm can generate returns that are higher than the returns on the market. So, if, let's call it now, opportunity cost of capital, opportunity cost of capital, and what is opportunity cost of capital? This is the return which the owner can earn elsewhere on the market outside the company. So, if the owner can earn 10% return, and here's the key from portfolio theory, for the same level of risk, mm -hmm. for the same level of risk as the company, if he can earn 10%, then the opportunity cost of capital is 10%. So, opportunity cost of capital is whatever the investor, investor can earn on the market outside the company for a comparable risk. All right? This is the opportunity cost of capital. So, return, return on project. Return on a project, meaning a company will be investing in a tractor, in a taxi, in a pipeline, in whatever it is invested. So the company has what we call investment projects. A return on investment project must be greater than opportunity cost of capital. Opportunity cost of capital. So, if the company can reinvest a 12%, but the opportunity cost is 10% for the same level of risk, then the company, we say, creates value. All right? It creates Value. This is equivalent of saying that there is a positive present value of growth opportunities. That the present value of growth opportunities is positive. So, a company has a growth opportunities not when it grows, which is totally wrong. But when we can grow at a rate that is faster than the opportunity cost of capital. In other words, when it has investment projects which will return higher return than the market for the same risk. All right? So just because a company can grow does not mean that it's good. All right? That's extremely important to understand. Mm -hmm. So, a company may be growing, but it may be growing at an extremely high risk. It may be growing at such a high risk that the opportunity cost of capital is 20%. All right? And it will be returning only 15 Is that very clear? Yeah. So, say, oh, the company is growing really fast and it's offering 15%. Return. But if this real fast growth implies risk that indicates from portfolio theory 20% return, then it's no good. Alright? You guys are staring like, what's going on? Does it make perfect sense? Yes, sir. But I've worked on the <laughs> so, again, it's important to understand that just growth for the sake of growth is no good. Growth is good only if it can provide return which is higher than what the market can provide elsewhere. Alright, so, if 
So, so return. So when return on a project, we call it an investment project, is greater than return, which is the required return. All right. So if the project return is higher than the required return, uh, what I'm actually doing now is teaching uh, elementary corporate finance. Elementary. But you got to understand that there is a connection between elementary corporate finance and investment. So when the return on a project is the same, uh, is greater than the required return, then you reinvest. Then you reinvest. When the return on a project is less than the required yeah. return, then the answer is you don't invest. And if you don't invest and have free cash flow, then the answer is pay out or distribute as a dividend. So, this is one of the most important points to understand and also what you have to understand that it has to be for a comparable risk. And here's the next key. The return of the project you do not discount with the risk of the company. So, we have a certain company, you will not discount the required rate of return, will not be the return of the company. You will take the risk of the project itself. So a company may take an extremely risky project and the company itself might be safe. If it has an extremely risky project, it better require a high return on it. In other words, the required rate of return on an investment project should compare to the risk of the project itself, not to the risk of the company. All right. So, of course, net present value, positive net present value of a project implies reinvestment and implies positive uh, value of the growth. present value of the growth opportunities. All right. Is that fairly clear? Because it is commonly misunderstood that the company can grow. But the question is, it can grow, but at what risk it will grow? Alright? Just growing, because of growing doesn't mean, you know, it may grow like GM. Yes, GM grew real fast. But the project it was investing in were profitable. You gotta understand, it's not growth for growth. It is growth for the sake of profitability. You want to grow the company in order to grow the current and future profitability of the company, not to create a big monster like GM, which becomes too big to bail out to the point of we got to let it go, right? So let's see what's next. P ratios and stock risk. I discussed this uh, idea that higher growth implies inherently higher risk. And just because a company will have high growth does not mean that itself, it's quite the opposite. The growth itself implies higher risk. Is that fairly clear? Mess and continue with other key points from the rest of the chapter. All right, so let's see if we're expected in okay, riskier stocks will have. Let's try this now. If risk 
is rising implies that PE is falling. Let's explain this. So, whenever the risk of a company increases, PE is falling. So, if the stock is safe, you are willing to pay 10 times the current earnings. But if the stock is risky, you're willing to pay only 6. Well, how does it work? Well, very simple. Suppose there is little risk. So, if there is little risk, the stock will earn what percent? If there's little risk, what's going to be the required return? Well, let's say the required return is 10%, and 10% required return will imply PE of 10. Alright? So, 10% required return is PE of 10. Well, what happens if the stock is significantly more risky. Well, you're going to be requiring, let's say, 20. If you're requiring 20%, this implies that the price earnings ratio will be 5. Alright, so now you see how high risk requires a lower price earnings ratio. Alright? Now, let's explain it in a different way. Let's explain it now in a very different way. So, this is the result. Well, what's the intuition behind it? The intuition behind it is this. Price today is 100. Suppose the price today is 100 and the stock is relatively low risk. The stock is relatively low risk. What kind of earnings you will take for a low risk? What kind of earnings you're going to take today for a low risk? 10% so what's the earnings? 10. 10. So earnings equals 10 for a low risk, alright? Now, suppose that the same stock, again, and here's the key, I already fixed the price of 100, and is a high risk. The answer now is, oh, if this stock is safe, I'll pay 100 and I require earnings of 10. But if the stock is high risk, I will require earnings of 20. You see? So, if the, when I pay 100, I'll be happy with 10 if it's relatively safe. If it is a very high risk, I'll require 20. Well, let's explain this one step further to understand it better. What if this is no risk, zero risk, which I will just call government bond when there's government bond and risk is zero meaning no risk how much am I going to be willing to accept today? Five. five meaning the risk rate interest rate the government yields today about four or five percent so earnings is five so government bond provides the floor on earnings so if the price is 100, for a government bond, I'll require a return of 5 to compensate me for the $100 for my opportunity cost at the given risk. You increase the risk, the risk a little, I'll require a little higher earnings. You increase the risk a lot, I'll require a lot higher earnings. Well, as risk rises, the required earnings rise and therefore the price earnings ratio must necessarily fall. Alright? So, in booming times, in other words, 
let's now try to do this is the next relationship. Uh, let's say this. You have strong economic growth. So, you have economic growth going higher. When you have economic growth going higher, two things happen. Number one, the, I'm talking about the whole economy. Macroeconomic growth goes up. Number one, earnings grow. Well, nobody said anything about inflation. We just say the economy is growing, whether it's real or just forget inflation. Earnings grow. When earnings grow, what does it mean for the price earnings ratio? Everything will grow because the floor will grow. Well, remember, I already wrote it a little before. If you expect higher growth, other things equal, price earnings ratio will be rising. Will be rising. So, PE will be rising as a result of expected growth or higher growth of earnings. That's the one part. That's the earnings part. Well, when the economy is booming and it's very strong and everything is great, then what happens to overall risk or at least risk perceptions in the economy? They fall. So, risk goes down. And when risk goes down, what happens to the price earnings ratio? Go up, Go up again. So, and finally, when you have economic growth, the earnings grow themselves. So what you have is that during economic growth, you have a number of factors which point to price earnings ratio rising. So economic boom results in rising price earnings ratios. And economic bust results in falling. We call these contracting price earnings ratios. Alright? So, one of the key characteristics to understand, now this is the key word, to understand stock markets is through understanding price earnings ratios and understanding that in a recession, price earnings ratios fall. And to understand the earnings fall. So, yeah, let's try to do this. Let's try to do this. In a recession, okay? Prices, oh, sorry, sorry, my mistake, my mistake. Earnings fall simply because in bad times, earnings fall. Risk. And right. price earnings fall, okay? Price earnings fall, okay? So, that was the multiple of falls. And as a result, the price falls a lot. Alright? Yes. Let's provide an example for dummies. Alright? So, from a boom, earnings, earnings go down from three to two dollars. Alright? So, this is boom, this is bust. In boom, it earns three. In bad times, it earns two. Now, the PE, price earnings ratio, uh, from 15 falls to 10. Alright? PE falls from 15 to 10. What happens to the price? So, we, we say this is boom, we say this is bust. The price here is, in a boom is what? 15. Look, earnings is 3. In the multiple, price earnings is 15. When you multiply earnings times price earnings, you get the price itself. 45. 45. And here the price is 20. So, your earnings barely fell some, but your price fell a lot. All right? Question? Yeah, it's the same thing the other way around. When we say risk, and the boom goes up. Yes. So, so when you have a booming economy, the risk falls. Uh, I 
mean, but in a recession? In, in a recession, the risk rises for everybody. For banks, for automakers, for real estate, for everybody, the risk is suddenly rising, correct? And then the PE goes up. Uh, yes, the PE goes as a result of, to reflect the higher risk. Yes, so what's the question? No, just reinstating. Yes, that's what, that's what I already wrote. That rising risk during a bust results in falling price earnings ratio. So, for the overall market, from boom to bust, a little bit of a change in earnings and a little bit of a change in price earnings ratio results in a huge fall in the price because the price falls a lot. It falls 20% from here, 20% from here, falls for 40 or 50%. Two questions. Uh, yeah. The price goes up, right? Yes, the price goes up and it goes up both because earnings go up and because the price to earnings ratio go up. So, in the boom, let's change this. Uh, earnings go from 2 to 3 and the multiple goes from 10 to 15 and the price goes from 20 back to 45. So, the point to understand is that a little bit of a change in the overall macroeconomy results in a significant change in price. In other words, the stock market is very sensitive to changes in the overall macroeconomy. This is another fundamental reason why figuring out the overall economic growth, boom or a bust or recession, is so terribly important in investing. Next question. When the economic growth, uh, growth is up, the question is why risk goes down. Well, because everyone's got a lot of money. You build a house, it's easier to sell the house, so the construction company will make more money. There is an economic growth, there are salaries, you're a bank, you give a loan. During the boom, people have easy time returning the loan. All right? You're a car dealer, you get more cars. The economy is booming, people walk in, they're willing to pay a high price, they're willing to buy more cars, you make more money as a car dealer. Whatever your business is, and whatever you're selling, in booming times, it's easier to sell more and at a higher price than during the bust. So, no matter what you're selling, you're going to be selling more and better of it, all right? So, and you're going to be making more profit. So, overall risk in a strong economy is relatively low. Well, think of it this way. When you have a terrible recession, you may get 50, 60, or 70% of all businesses losing profitability and being endangered for bankruptcy. Alright? So, in a bus, suddenly everyone runs the risk of bankruptcy. Alright? During the boom times, you did not have even one bank going bankrupt. Now, number of banks is 50, 60 already so far this year in 2009. Alright? Does this clarify? Alright, let's see, uh, try to finish for today. So, being risk analysis, I did this. Alright, so what you should be looking for? The one thing to be aware is called earnings management. Earnings management. Earnings are, as you understand, extremely important. Extremely important for valuation. So, management of corporations will do anything they can to make earnings look better and nicer in order to boost their share price so that they can look better. So, what management will do all sorts of accounting tricks and all sorts of accounting games to manipulate earnings. So, one of the most important things to understand is 
as corporations have tried to manage and manipulate earnings and play games and all sorts of things. I don't want to get into that. That's a whole different subject that I will highly recommend you to take. It's called forensic accounting. Forensic accounting is you actually look into, you actually look into uh, the accounting balance sheet and statement and try to figure out what's going on and what is the real story of it. So forensic accounting is what you need to learn and what you need to study. And people who do standard financial statement analysis by taking this ratio and this ratio and this ratio and this ratio and just comparing the numbers are foolish and naive in doing that because they aren't getting good clean numbers because the CFO's job is to deliver dirty numbers that make accounting statements look better than they are. His job is to, to keep two books. One is to get the book, keep the books straight so that they know what's really going on and another one is to keep cookbooks so that investors don't know what's really going on but get a much rosier picture than the reality really, really is. And at Global Crossings and Enron and all the other, we call these, they are known, that's where the textbook started, the accounting scandals because management overcooked the books. But every management is cooking the books within the permission. The job of financial analysts is to reverse engineer the cooking of the books and uncook them in order to provide a proper uh, analysis. For example, corporations use one-time uh, restructuring charges, one-time charge for layoff, one-time charge for this, one-time charge for that. Many corporations were caught later on using one-time charges for a particular item nine times in a row. And they say, oh, it's a one-time charge, it is not part of the operating. Well, one-time charge means that it happens one time. There was a bad flood and the flood will happen next time. But what corporations do is, for example, they get this, let's say, layoff with restructuring. They lay off some people, they restructure, oh, it's a one-time charge, it doesn't count. Well, the next quarter, they do the same. They lay off people, one-time charge, oh, it doesn't count. Uh, let's provide an example where I was a true, genuine insider. Sterling Commerce, which was a uh, subsidiary of SBC Corporation, which I worked between 2000 and 2004. 2000, dot-com telecom bus, it was a software company within a telecom, SPC communications and telecom, uh, is in trouble. 2000 people, they lay off 200. And the cost of firing people and whatnot is a, you know, restructuring whatever charge, one-time expense. Well, three months later, they do a second layoff. 200 more people go. It's another one-time expense. The third semester, third uh, quarter, 200 people more, one-time charge. Then the next one, 200 people more, one charge. The next one, 200 people more, one charge. So they keep these going and this manipulates the number. Well, I'm a sales analyst in there and I analyze sales and revenues and everything. I said, wow. The company's going down big time. Revenues are going down, everything's going down. You know, the company's, you know, in deep, deep, deep trouble. But the accounting statements look good. I said, this whole thing is totally absurd. Well, they're absurd when they look at the real numbers inside and what's going on, how we're we losing sales, how we're we losing customers, how customers aren't buying as much, or how we desperately need to make the sale so we allow the customers huge discounts, all right? So the way we do it is, you know, before we're selling software for $10,000 a piece, now we give them 30% discount for $7,000 a piece. We still 
book it as a revenue at 10 and the 3,000 discount, we expense it as a sales expense or a discount expense or a promotion expense or whatnot. But that's not what's really going on. We lower the price. But the revenue is not good because the number of content and software is the same, the number of sales is the same, the price per unit is the same, so revenues aren't falling. Well, we record them that they're not falling, but they are, and the price has gone down, and things are going from bad to worse. But when you look at economic statements, they don't look that bad at all, all right? And when you count, meaning when you don't count the one-time charges, things look even better. The company's actually improving when you look at the cook numbers, because, you know, we don't count the revenue straight, and we don't count the expenses straight, because the one-time charges, we don't really count that, because Wall Street looks only at the operating, not the total charge, because the one-time is just the one-time, it wouldn't repeat again. And, you know, accounting-wise, the company looks good, really good. While it's going down and is about to go bankrupt, and it almost did, they actually had to uh, lay off eventually 75% of all people, 80% of all people. The company shrank five times just to survive. The seventh layoffs got me in 2004. You know, that's when I got laid off. All right, so uh, that was, of course, the end of my corporate career. So I went back to, uh, to academics. All right, so this is earnings management, and I just gave you a real-world example of which I lived through. And of course, you read Enron, you read, you know, Global Crossing, you read, you know, just write accounting scandals. Now, the, the modern word is called accounting shenanigans in Google, and you can read 1,000 uh, cases. But this is what's to be. So what is important is not to look at the accounting earnings, what is important to look at economic earnings. And economic earnings are those earnings that can be sustained in the mid and the long run and account for all costs and all expenses. All right? Including the depreciation of the linoleum on the floor and the depreciation of the light bulbs. All right? Let's see what's next so that we can finish and go home. Yeah, there are some other measures, price to book ratios and price to cash flows. You will read those. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm pretty much done. There is some... There is a section, yeah. a section on uh, yeah. the limitations.